Hi everyone, my name is Brett Drummond. I'm one of the co-founders of MS Translate. Welcome to another one of our research summary videos where today I'm gonna to be talking about recent research, looking at whether Epstein-Barr virus is the cause of multiple sclerosis. Now, before I continue, take this little break just to click subscribe to make sure that you can stay up to date with all of our videos that we publish as soon as they're released. So there's been a lot of coverage that you might have seen online over the past 24 to 48 hours uh, talking about some research that's come out of Harvard looking at whether Epstein-Barr virus is the cause of multiple sclerosis. Now, if you followed MS Translate for a while, you may recall that we did a summary video around about a year ago now of a German study that also was looking into the role of Epstein-Barr virus in multiple sclerosis. Now, depending on what platform you're watching this video on, you can click on either the link in the description or the link here to watch that video. And essentially in that study, what they found was that in their cohort of people living with multiple sclerosis, they found that 100% of those individuals had been previously infected with Epstein-Barr virus. Now, to provide a little bit of background on this, if you're new to this topic, Epstein-Barr virus uh, is a really common virus. It's uh, found uh, to have infected around about 90% um, of the general population, but it is the virus that causes glandular fever. Now, you may be thinking not 90% of the population has experienced glandular fever, and that is true. In most cases, when people get infected with Epstein-Barr virus or EBV, they do not experience glandular fever. They do not come down with any symptoms. However, that is the virus that causes glandular fever or infectious mononucleosis, as it's known in some parts of the world. Now, the story around EBV and MS has been around for a long time, uh, but originally it was thought to not be a too strong a case because, as I said, around 90% of the general population um, has been infected with EBV, whereas sort of 10 to 15 years ago, we believed it was around about 95% of people living with multiple sclerosis had been infected with EBV. Now, this German study across quite a large cohort of people shown that when they used multiple techniques, more sensitive techniques to determine whether or not there had been a previous infection, they found that it was actually in 100% of people living with multiple sclerosis had had that infection and it wasn't that high in their healthy controls. So from that study, what they concluded was that infection with Epstein-Barr virus was critical to develop multiple sclerosis, but not sufficient. So essentially what that means is that you couldn't develop multiple sclerosis if you hadn't been previously infected with EBV, but having been infected with EBV is not enough to cause multiple sclerosis. And so there are other factors at play there. Now, when we're looking at this recent study that's come out of Harvard, what's interesting about this study is this was done in a lot of military veterans where they have um, a range of blood samples um, throughout the person's life. So they can go back and look at some of these blood samples before the diagnosis of multiple sclerosis. Now, again, what they found is in the, the military veterans who ended up developing multiple sclerosis, it was essentially 100% um, of those people had been previously infected with multiple sclerosis, so showing very similar results to what we saw in that previous German study. There was one individual in this study that appeared at their most uh, uh, latest time, po time point before developing S did before developing multiple sclerosis, I'm sorry, to have not been infected with EBV. Um, they're not quite sure about that case, whether or not that is actually a misdiagnosis and that person uh, doesn't have multiple sclerosis. Or in some very rare instances, what can happen is that there can be an infection with EBV, uh, but it doesn't show up in the blood. So it's possible that that had happened or that there was an EB infection in between the last blood sample and the diagnosis of multiple sclerosis. There was about a three month window in between there, but across the 900 plus individuals in the study, um, everyone else um, did have uh, a previous infection with EBV. And so what they found in this when they looked between the people living with MS and, and their healthy controls or the people that, that hadn't gone on to develop MS, 
They found that it was around about a 32-fold increase in terms of risk um, for those individuals that had had the EBV infection. What was probably a bit of an advance um, on this previous study is that they also looked at um, the presence of neurofilament light. So if you've been following multiple sclerosis research for a while, you may have heard of neurofilament light before. It's also called NFL. And essentially, this is a marker of damage to nerves that can be found in the blood. So for um, a few years now, there's been a lot of talk about measuring NFL um, to show progression in multiple sclerosis because it, it is a marker that may correlate well or, or link well to that damage that we would expect to see in multiple sclerosis. And what they found when they looked at a, a small cohort of the people in this study is that uh, what they could see is that previously to getting an Epstein-Barr uh, virus infection, those neurofilament light levels were not present. And then post um, getting that infection, they could see that they could measure um, NFL in the blood. So this was indicative um, that there was no damage, no actual multiple sclerosis, I guess, occurring prior to that infection, but occurring post that infection. So, you know, this, this I guess, provides some stronger evidence to suggest uh, that this infection, um, EVV, is a really important trigger in multiple sclerosis. They went on to look at some other viruses to see whether or not people were just susceptible to getting a viral infection just before they were diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. And so the, the finding of EBV was just a, a coincidence or more a fact of, you know, going the other way. The fact that because they had multiple sclerosis, they were susceptible to an EBV infection or other viral infections. But when they looked at other viral infections, um, they didn't see that same association. There wasn't that same increased risk that they saw with EBV. So from that, what they concluded was that it's actually um, the infection with EBV is increasing the risk of developing multiple sclerosis and not the other way around. So I guess there's a couple of points that I want to make from this. There, there is more that they found in the, the study, um, and I'm more than happy as always to answer any questions that you may have about this, and we can go into a lot more detail with these results. Two key points that I, I think I want to make, and let's start with the why is this interesting and why is this important and why are people excited about it? So I guess for that, if we now are seeing that um, EBV is a really necessary trigger in that similar to what we concluded from that German study, that if there is no EBV infection, you can't develop multiple sclerosis then potentially being able to prevent um, infection with EBV through the development of a protective vaccine, for example, um, could be a really effective preventative measure for the development of multiple sclerosis in the future. As well as that, there are ongoing studies that look at whether or not treating an EBV infection uh, can be a possible treatment for multiple sclerosis. So one of the things that's important about um, an EBV infection is that it tends to be a chronic infection. So once you are infected, it's never fully cleared from the body. And this has a couple of um, interesting links to multiple sclerosis. One, often this, this ongoing EBV infection is found in B cells, and you are probably aware that a couple of the really effective multiple sclerosis therapies act by depleting B cells. So in particular, you may have heard of ocrelizumab or ocrevus that does that. So is the clearance of some of this EBV infection part of the way that ocrevus has a positive effect in people with multiple sclerosis? That's unclear, but you know we could potentially draw a link there. Similarly, the chronic infection tends to hang out um, around the nervous system. And so obviously there is a link there with multiple sclerosis as well. But so there are uh, studies ongoing and a number of studies around the world looking at whether or not um, some form of in immunotherapy that's directly targeted at trying to clear um, that ongoing chronic EBV infection can potentially treat multiple sclerosis. Um, we have to wait and see on that. They're in very early stages at the moment, but we will continue to report back because that obviously has 
um, a huge impact for people who are currently living with multiple sclerosis. So, you know, we talk about potentially a vaccine as being able to be a preventative measure in the future, but um, potentially this could also be a way of treating people uh, who have already been diagnosed with multiple sclerosis as well. Those are all unknowns. We still need to work through that. Those studies are being done at the moment. The second point I want to make is just around how we think about these results. And while I think they're exciting and, and I think they back up what's been seen previously, I think we just need to be a little bit careful around the wording of some of these things because I have seen uh, a number of reports of this online that suggest that EBV is the cause of multiple sclerosis. Now, as I said, we know that that's not really true not in the, the truest sense of how that's being said, because it is um, very common to get an EBV infection, but not to develop multiple sclerosis. So we can't really think of an EBV infection as being the cause of multiple sclerosis. It's definitely necessary, or it certainly seems to be on the back of these two large studies, one from last year and one from this year, that it is a necessary part of a, a multiple sclerosis diagnosis. But what we know is that MS is a, a combination um, of genetic and environmental factors coming together. So while an EBV infection may be necessary, there also has to be other things going on for multiple sclerosis to develop. Now, we don't know exactly what those interactions are yet. There will be some genetic components. There may be other environmental components as well. But I think we just need to be a little bit careful around how we word this because we know, for example, what we don't want to happen is if we start to think of this as being the cause that people who develop glandular fever start to panic that that means that they will definitely get multiple sclerosis. We know that that's not the case. So I think, again, just to, to be really clear around this, and, and I say this often in MS Translate videos, it's just about being clear and being accurate in terms of how we can communicate this. Saying that, this is a really interesting finding. I'm sure that everyone in our community uh, will hopefully be um, interested in watching this video and have questions and want to engage in a conversation about it. So please do drop me some comments uh, under the video and I'll make sure that I respond to all of them as quickly as possible. We will continue to provide updates on this research in this really exciting area. Um, and I look forward to talking to you again soon. I hope that's been helpful to everyone. Thank you.